Hi everybody! Welcome to week three! I got my buddy right here, this is Totoro. He'll be helping me out today. This video might be a little bit long, so I'm going to try to break it down into little sections. If you go to the uh, timeline bar on the bottom of the YouTube video, there should be time cards for you, just for general ideas, so if you don't want to sit here for a long time, you can just watch it in little chunks, but let's get started. So this is week uh, three, part one, and we're just looking at characterization, theme, and some background of the stories that we're going to read this week, which are The Lottery and There Will Come Soft Rains. But let's go ahead and get started. Real quick, short stories. They have these points, right? It's a plot diagram. So you have exposition, conflict, rise in action, climax, falling action, and of course, resolution. Easiest way that we begin to think of this is beginning, middle, and end. But there's really no point to a story unless we have a theme. So all those things connect together to build a theme. And they're going to be the underlying meaning of the story. Uh, sometimes it could be the universal truth and it's something true for all. Usually there's some idea or like underlying factor that builds that idea. And it's also like could possibly be a significant statement that the story is trying to make about society or human nature. If you're looking at our stories this week, they might have theme trying to be a statement about society or the human condition. So theme is universal truth. If you're going to write a story that's a universal truth, you're looking at something that everyone goes through, a statement about life. So if you're watching like a teenage uh, comedy, usually people are trying to discover like, what am I going to do after high school? Most people experience that. That's the theme, growing up, becoming independent. If you go later, and let's say if someone's 40, you're looking at a midlife crisis. What are they thinking of? A lot of people discover like, you know, my reflection of my half of my life. And then what is the next uh, 40 years or more are going to be in that way. But we're just looking, uh, when you're looking at a theme as universal truth, it's just ideas that people go through. It could also be more abstract that it's just ideas or concepts that people might think about, even though we don't necessarily um, experience it. So if you're looking at any like futuristic sci-fi movie, like uh, the Matrix, the whole idea that is this a simulation, it's a thought experiment, and we don't know if we're in a virtual world or not. There's actually no proof. The only thing we can prove is that we exist. Don't worry about it. We're not going to describe it because it would take way too much time. But just like some ideas are going to be with everyone, and everyone has similar ideas in terms of these universal truths. Another idea of theme is like the meaning of life. So the theme expresses the author's opinion, or raises a question about human nature or the meaning of human experience. So if we're thinking of consciousness, the idea of knowing that we exist, what's the point of that? If you're looking at you know, a philosophical stance, why is that the case that we are the most dominant species in the world? What does that mean? Is there a purpose or isn't there? What is the meaning? Oh no! Hold on, I fix it. Hopefully it's good. So we're looking at the idea that we are trying to discover like what is the whole point of us being on this rock that we call Earth. And it's not always gonna be the case that you agree with the author on what they're saying. And if it's well written, the work will still have a theme that illuminates some aspects of true human life and experience, even if you don't agree with it. So even if you don't agree with it, the idea and the intent is to have the concept that we are going to be able to empathize or have a feeling of understanding of where these people are coming from and what their concepts are from. And that's just another idea of theme. And the whole goal of theme is to create a common ground between the author and the reader and working together to have a general idea that you can see the message that they're trying to say. 
you don't have to agree with it, but you have to be able to you know, understand what they're trying to say. And even though people will have a different experience from the story, the general underlying truths that we have in the story are a connection that both you and the writer are seeking. So if we're looking at a post-apocalyptic movie or book like The Hunger Games, we have it, most of us haven't experienced that kind of society. However, we can understand that if things are happening, like it could possibly, I mean, it would be very rare, but it's a slim chance that it could actually happen someday. And because of that, we are reflecting on, you know, what are things that we as a society do that are similar to The Hunger Games. And another important thing about theme is to make sure that theme does not explain the entire story. Most stories will have multiple themes inside it. In fact, unless you're thinking of children's you know, books, there's going to be more than one theme. Even in uh, the stories that we're reading today, there are multiple themes. But we're just going to look and have you try to discover just one or two of them, maybe. And as we're going to theme, a lot of that comes from the characters and how they develop it. So whenever we say character analysis, I think a lot of times people think that it's so complicated that it could be beyond science, perhaps. But if you're looking at analysis, analysis really just means to take apart. So we're just taking apart the actions and the uh, attributes of a character and looking at their significance within the story. So there are four major types of uh, characterization. So the character can talk about like its physical description, what they look like, maybe what they smell like, what they sound like, eh, et cetera, taste, hear like, what do they say, and what are the actions that they do. Maybe uh, another type of characterization comes from uh, what the author actually says about the person. So you could have an author say, oh, she was smart, but lazy or Harry Potter was lazy and had an awesome scar. That's a blend of their state of being, a direct comment, as well as their physical description. And another thing can uh, finally come from characterization is that what other characters describe that character to be and the actions that they do on that character. So four types. Physical, what do they look like? What do they do and what do they sound like? And what are they saying? What does the narrator or the author say about the character? And what do other characters say about that character? Four types of characterization. I think you can't see this little light there because it's green. That's cool. And then, so we have characterization that describe what a character is. And then there's four types of characters. So we have a round character, dynamic character, flat character, and static. Round is a complex, fully actualized character. They have dealt depth. Round, you can see all sides of them. A dynamic, that means that they change and develop throughout the story, just like people do. So complex character is going to change. Uh, on the inverse side or on the opposite side, you're going to have a flat character that's only described by one or two things. Maybe they're a bully. Maybe they're mean. Maybe they're fast. Maybe they're the uh, opponent. That's it. We don't need anything else because... They're a minor character. And another thing about a minor character, a lot of times is that they're static or they don't change. They stay the same. So if they're a bully, they stay the bully in the story. Versus if our main uh, character or our major character, they're changing and developing, that's a good sign that they're dynamic and round. So I think it's difficult to see here, but behind me, I have Iron Man. And I think he's, I mean, I... It's safe to assume that he's a major character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So as an example, a round character is three-dimensional. They have good and bad qualities. So if you look at Avengers Endgame, in the beginning, Iron Man didn't want to go back in time to try to stop Thanos. But then things happen, and he makes a decision near the end, too. So he's good and bad. He has a family he wants to keep, and he doesn't want to risk losing that. Does that make him bad? Not necessarily. But does it make him selfish? Possibly. And the dynamic. Do they change? Iron Man's choices, he changes throughout that story. That's why he's a major character. He's round and dynamic. 
minor characters on the other side. Let's use the same Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. They're the biggest movies ever. Minor characters are flat, so they are only described by two, one or two things. I didn't even remember these people's names. I just know that they were the henchmen to Thanos. They're bad, and each of them have some ability, like strength, speed, fighting skills, or magic. And they're static because they stay evil throughout the whole movie. They don't switch sides, so because of that, given that we only know that they're bad... That's a bug. So we know that they're bad. That's the only trait that we know. And then they stay bad, so that means that they're static. So by default, we know that they are most likely a minor character. And as we're looking at characterization and defining characters, another big thing are protagonist and antagonist. A lot of people use protagonist as a way to think of the superhero versus villain. That's not the case. All protagonist really means is the main character of a story. The reason why we use uh, superhero so much is because it's the easiest thing for us to associate. So if you want to say protagonist, pro, he is good, Batman, just for you know understanding that works. But really in literary terms, it's just the main character. And then on the opposite side, an antagonist is a character or force that opposes the protagonist. I know it says four. I wasn't thinking of golf. It's a typo. We all make mistakes. So, example, Batman, main character of the comic book series, Joker, is directly opposing Batman or Bruce Wayne. And that's protagonist and antagonist. This is all just background info to get into our two ratings today, which are dystopian literature. So dystopian literature is a literary story where the author imagines a country or a society where there is great suffering and or injustice. So when we're looking at this, most dystopian novels we can think of usually have um, similar themes. They're not always the same, but they have you know a general trend. And because of that, most uh, you know. The most common types of conflict or, you know, the, yeah, the conflict that we see in dystopian stories are either going to be person versus society or person versus technology. And oftentimes there's even more than that. But just for this week, let's just think of person versus society and person versus uh, technology. So the Hunger Games, if we've seen the movie, we know that society has this whole premise that people, you know, are randomly selected to play this real-world survival game where there is one person that's the victor. And because of that, it's a reflection of how does society, you know, treat individuals. And even though we can assume that we're probably not going to have a, you know, society like that, we can empathize that there are some things that we do as a society that could be you know, seen in a negative light similar to this. So a lot of reality shows that are built off of the suffering of someone, uh, Fear Factor, which I think you weren't even born when it came out. So the idea was that people were going to do tasks that were uh, fear-inducing. And then person versus te uh, technology is the idea of the threat of technology and even though there are great things in technology, there's also some drawbacks. And we'll just describe some ideas there. So person versus society is when a protagonist's conflict extends to confronting institutions, traditions, or laws of his or her culture. He or she struggles to overcome them, either uh, triumphing over uh, corrupt society or failing miserably, if we read the rest. So these are just some examples. If we're looking at the book, 1984, it's a whole story where a government watches everyone in the society to see if they're doing any right or wrongdoing. And because of that authoritarianism, everyone is you know controlled and their freedoms are basically gone. Even though we're not in that world, we have you know security breaches. Webcams are hacked all the time. We have traffic cameras everywhere. So some people build that idea of society 
is observing people more than ever. Is that a good or a bad thing? On one hand, we're able to find a lot of people that are either missing or abducted much more quickly. But on the other hand, now people are being watched when they are not giving consent. Fahrenheit, 50, Fahrenheit 451, also by Ray Bradbury, is a similar take that people um, go for you know simple pleasures and they don't uh they're not allowed to read because then that will question authority and that's what is an example of walling uh it's just one of many uh, types of conflict that they have but people left earth because of society not wanting to fix any problems and again at the end of the story they go back to earth to fix it and then captain america winter soldier is actually closer is pretty closely related to 1984 uh, the idea that um, government is watching people. There was something that was released in 2000 and... Uh, uh, it started in 2007, and it was called the PRISM Scandal, that uh, the government had the right to listen to phone call conversations and the uh, idea to uh, stop terrorism. So on the good hand, the goal is to stop terrorism. However, people were also being listened to without their consent. That's just some ideas of person versus society. You can also look at some aspects of this in one or both of the readings today. And then person versus te uh, technology is the example when humanity's innate skepticism about the wonders of technology has resulted in many stories in which antagonists, again, people that oppose the main character, use technology to gain power or which technology takes over and becomes a malign influence on society. So Mad Max is based on the future when people uh, become too dependent on um, fossil fuels and it becomes scarce and there's wars based off of gasoline. The Matrix is the idea of technology basically controlling and making a virtual world and people don't even know the difference between a real world and a virtual world. A lot of people think of this as um, like video games and how people become so um, enveloped in it. And then finally, uh, Wally, the ship that all the humans were on, they became dependent on it, and because of it, they almost died because they couldn't take care of themselves. It's another idea of conflict. These are just some more dystopian themes. I would definitely look at this when you're writing your response in the discussion because you could use this as an example. These are just one of many, many, many things that you could use a dystopian story but i think you could build an uh, argument for that and if you want some uh, guidance we could help out uh this week in week three to discover that for one of the stories as well and let's go ahead and look at the stories that we will read this week the lottery by shirley jackson that's one of our stories that we'll read she was born in 1916 and passed away in 1965 she was a an american writer most famous for horror and mystery novels uh, her most famous book was The Haunting of Hill House, but she also had 200 short stories. Uh, one of the most common uh, stories of hers that are taught in school is The Lottery, which is what we're going to read this week. So what about The Lottery? I'm not going to tell you a summary of the text, but what we can know is that it's built, or it was built, it was published in 1948 in The New Yorker. And even though we read it a lot today, it was panned and given very negative reviews. In fact, some states were uh, banning the story and many, many people canceled their subs uh, subscription to The New Yorker and they also had a uh, hate mail sent over there for some issues. So when we're reading the story, just have an idea that people didn't like this idea. Even though now we look at it as a great um, reflection of, you know, looking and reflecting on society. And there are many themes that we can associate and compare to today. Let's look at what was going on in 1948. So things that were happening, um, the war was over. So because of that, oh, I'm sorry. So war is over. This major complex of building machinery uh, or weapons slowed down a lot. So now this idea was that in order to fight uh, Russia, 
we had to continue making more and more arms, uh, weapons for one, and also continue to buy things to, you know, beat the uh, communist Iron Curtain. Another example that was happening during the day were the Jim Crow laws, which is uh, what we most simply know now as segregation, but it was more than that. Uh, the laws were put in place to separate individuals by ethnicity, and they were supposed to, like, technically, they said that they were separate but equal. However, um, if you're separating people by ethnicity, uh, the white population almost always had the better conditions and um, living areas, areas than uh, people of color. And it's not, uh, we often think of it as being in uh, the Southern United States, but these ideas and this philosophy was throughout the whole country. So one idea is something called a sundown town, which people of color were not allowed to be in the town uh, after sundown, otherwise they could be uh, attacked or killed. And also, yeah, um, if you're looking at it, we can discuss it more next week if you want to know more about Jim Crow laws and how that has a systemic change and how you're building this idea of the haves and have-nots or first-class and second-class citizens. Another big thing was the Red Scare. So that was the Soviet Union, also known as the USSR, to what we now most generally call Russia. And the fear was that uh, communism was going to invade and take over the United States. And this led to the Red Scare, but also it led to the Cold War, which was this unofficial um, flexing competition, basically. So the United States would build more weapons, Russia would build more weapons, or the USSR would, and it would continue and continue and continue. And with the Red Scare, what would happen is that people were... Uh, that were perceived perceived to be communist were blacklisted or basically never allowed to work in any industry again or even exiled. So this was most often common of people getting uh, fired either as writers in the Hollywood industry or actors. And the most famous person that was exiled from the United States was Charlie Chaplin, who was the most famous actor of the time. And he was able to enter back in the United States about decades later. And finally, if we're looking at this idea, and this will make more sense when we're reading the story, but during World War II, there were also Japanese internment camps, which is where U.S. citizens who were of Japanese descent were considered a threat to the United States in World War II as potential spies, and they were sent into these camps where they were monitored and isolated, and they were given anywhere from 48 hours to two weeks to um, basically like hand over their property to other people and get their belongings and be forced to live here, which unfortunately, most of these people were US citizens. So the question is, was that a violation of their inalienable rights or the rights of being a citizen? And now let's look at There Will Come Soft Rains. Again, it was written by Ray Bradbury. He was born in 1920 and he died in 2012 and he's one of the most famous science fiction uh, authors, uh, American authors, if you're thinking of, about that. In fact, he is the person that kind of um, made science fiction no longer a guilty pleasure for people, but actually considered to be an art form. Uh, I would say the most famous people now that have that, that are taught in school is going to be Ray Bradbury and Kurt Vonnegut even though there are many, like Isaac Asimov is also just as important. But his um, best works are known as his dystopian novels and short stories, which we will read one of them today. He uh, published more than 30 books, 600 short stories, many poems, essays, and plays. He was really prolific. He would write at least two hours a day up until, I believe, like his last year of his life. And There Will Come, there will come Soft Rains, the idea, it was published in 1950, but it was based in the year 2026. I have a picture of a mushroom cloud from an atomic bomb. I think you can uh, hopefully use the context to see what this book's about, or not book, but short story. So what was going on in 1950? So the idea, number one was consumerism. Or no, let's not talk about that yet. Let's go ahead and look at the Cold War. Like I said before, 
This is that a nuclear arsenal was increased on both sides of uh, Russia and the United States. At its height, there were over 64,000 nuclear warheads today, where there are about 10 to 11,000 now. And the current arsenal can kill 3 billion people around the world. So multiply that by 6, and there's a population of only about 7 and a half billion people you have the ability to basically kill people multiple times over. So that's one aspect of the Cold War. This threat is going on. And even though it's never um, on the surface, or you know, it's never a, an immediate threat, except for two events in history that you'll learn later in uh, social studies, it was always a, a fear that this could happen and people could be eliminated at any moment and they can't do anything. And the other idea, too, is the uh, beginning of American consumerism. So the idea of this disposal uh, society that we live in today, that we upgrade our phones every couple of years, that we continue to buy new clothes every season, it didn't really go into high uh, gear until the 1950s. The reason being is that during World War II, um, most production companies or most uh, you know, plants and factories were building arms and goods for the war. And once that ended, in order to keep the economy running, you had to find some way to have people continue to buy and build things. One example is that instead of having one thing for, you know, decades, like a stove or a fridge, you would upgrade. And there are also, you know, new ideas in technology. There was, you know, refrigeration, like a freezer that was common. AC began to, you know, become more popular. Televisions, cars, uh, buying homes, and the suburbs really started in the 1950s. So this idea of spending and just having things to keep up and compete with other people because they're buying things. And we see that to this day. Right now, people are already buying the uh, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S, even though they're sold out. And people are now paying $800 for a device that would cost anywhere from four to $500. And that is a summary of our poem, or of our poem, for our beginning of week one, week three, part one. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I'll have um, open meeting times all week this week. Good luck. See you.